Welcome to another action-packed adventure on Rock Forever. We have a Canadian legend here. He is not only the lead singer and guitarist of Coney Hatch, he has been a part of royalty in Canada with so many great projects. We're going to talk about it, or should I say the Coney Hatch Lunatic Asylum. Please welcome <laughs> Carl Dixon. Hey, guys. Welcome to the show, Carl. Thank you. It's, it's a great big virtual event happening October 3rd. We're going to spread the word, get everybody tuning in. I know you're going to be playing all the hits and the new stuff and, and all that, yeah. Coney Hatch 4. But uh, let's go back a little bit. You know, I know, obviously, you grew up in Canada, and uh, we got to give you the MVP award, not only for being part of Anthem Records, you know, the Rush-related label with Ray Daniels, but, of course, yeah. produced by Kim Mitchell and – not only the great four albums with Coney Hatch, but being a part of April Wine and singing with Guess Who, which are, of course, like Canadian, you know, legends. So yes. we give you the MVP award. You are the <laughs> rock survivor. Please tell us about, you know, growing up and falling in love with, you know, rock and roll and who, who some of your biggest influences were. Well, when I grew up, I was uh, up in northern Ontario at the Steel Town, Sault Ste. Marie, uh, right where the Great Lakes all meet. And, uh, it was 40 below every winter there, so there was, we did a lot of indoor things. Um, when I was uh, just starting to get old enough to appreciate music was when the glory days of rock were coming along. Uh, Credence was on the charts in the last days of the Beatles and Stones and uh, the Guess Who were having their, their start of their hit records. And uh, then, you know, I got into Johnny Winter and Live, Humble Pie, Mountain, Jethro Tull. So many of the great, the Who, of course, so many of the great bands that came around that time. And that really set my course for, wow, I want to, I want to be in that world. <laughs> yeah, those classic 70s, you know, where the bands just really, the labels didn't mess with them, man. They came out, you know, with, with the real deal. They, they, and there was such diversity, too. You know, you, you yeah. go from, from hearing a humble pie to a Sly and the Family Stone to a Santana to a, a Zeppelin to, uh, you know, Pink Floyd. I mean, it was really, really deep and diverse. Sure. And, you know, I went at, the Guess Who, of course, for Canada, because uh, they were the first Canadian band to make it big internationally. And they had uh, the hit records, American Woman Around the World. And it was what we'd uh, be so excited to go run down to the store when we heard the next Guess Who album was about to come out. So that was a big influence as well. And, you know, the, when I was in the band, the guys were telling me about those glory days. They'd have the Guess Who and Mahavishnu Orchestra and Ozark Mountain on the same bill in the concert halls in those days. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't how things later became much more homogenized. And you had to have the same kind of music throughout the bill. There was real diversity and, and real interest in those different kinds of things in those yeah, yeah. No, it was all it was all about the music, you know, and that's what we love. So tell us about how Coney Hatch came together. I know it was um, early 70s for you, but how did you guys, you know, um, re really form? What was the, the idea when you put the group together? Well, it wasn't early 70s. It was early 80s. I was still in elementary school in the early 70s. Okay. Well, you, <laughs> we, you were we got together... Uh, you're listening to all that music that, that helped form the group, I guess. So early 80s it was. Yes. Yes. So I was, uh, I was in another band in Montreal for a couple of years. I moved there from Ontario to make my way there, and it wasn't working out. So I came back to Ontario, and, and uh, I was looking in the classified ads from the Toronto Star newspaper every morning and uh, to see, you know, who's hiring and what the next opportunity might be. And there was an ad in the paper one morning, touring rock band with management seeks guitar playing singer or singing guitar player or something. Uh, and so I called in, I was impressed. They had management, they had bookings off into the next year and I really needed to work. So it wasn't even much. It, they, they were playing a lot of ACDC at the time wasn't really into much but you know i needed a gig so i said love it <laughs> yeah acdc cool man so before i knew it i was on stage replacing the original singer uh, who they'd done about a year with 
and singing all these ACDC songs. And uh, we were also doing, oh, Frank Zappa, Crew Slut, and UFO music, and uh, who else? The Police, and Van Halen, all, all kinds of cover band stuff. But what really intrigued me with Coney Hatch, when I went to watch them, it was, it was their, their singer decided he didn't want to be a musician anymore. He wanted to go back to school and get a degree. So I watched them, and they played what I thought was the most most odd collection of original songs of their own I'd ever heard. But what impressed me was they had about a dozen of them. And so I really, really want to go someplace. And that, that's the difference. If you, if you want to be a recording act, you need songs. So um, I had already been writing songs for years. So once I joined to replace the original guy, we really got down to work together. And we, within uh, the first three weeks, we had appeared on our first Coney Hatch album. Or picking the place and a sound and a, and a style, of melding our four different influences. It was it was kismet, I suppose. Yeah, well, I know you're going to be playing some of the classics from that album for sure, and of course, produced by Kim Mitchell. It definitely sets you on yes. on a uh, mark to you know, head down the border. What, what are your first memories of, of playing in America? And, you know, was that, was that important for the band to, to be looked at as a North American band? Oh, very much. You know, Canada, we, we love our country and we have a, a Canadian kind of sound and outlook, but you can never be uh, really successful by only... Uh, making it in Canada. You really do have to look further afield. And everybody who puts music out there hopes it'll be an international success, that they'll, they'll be noticed. And that's part of the fun of being a musician is to tour so all these different places around the world, some places you've only ever heard of or read about in, in Rolling Stone magazine or Cream magazine. And so my first, our first gig in the States was at the Cleveland Agora Ballroom. And uh, it was uh, the radio station there, WMMS, used to have their coffee break show. So our first show in the United States, we were rocking at 10.30 in the morning <laughs> from the ballroom, and they were broadcasting it live. So, uh, it was, uh, you know, people were so much in, more into rock in, in the general population then. So they could, they could uh, have listeners all over Cleveland and the region tuning in at 10.30 to hear an up-and-coming rock band. But what I remember... That we thought, oh boy, we'll go see a Cleveland Indians ball game because we've never, none of us, had, I think, had even visited the States before. So we went down there, and I think Andre Thornton was the star of the, the Cleveland Indians at that time. And we got down, and the park was so empty. It was the, the dog day, you know, the downtime of the Indians. We got a row seats and the catcher just about walked. And the, the park had maybe 5,000 in the hole. In place that held 60,000. So we, we had the hot dogs, we had the beer, and we thought, this is a life in America. This is great. Yeah, well, it's uh, definitely like that, you know, the, the music, the sports, the, you, you know, the, the lifestyle was all in one. And of course, you guys have uh, done some amazing tours, you know, with Iron Maiden, over 40 shows with them, and almost 30 shows with yeah. Judas Priest. And obviously, you hit it off well with Steve Harris of Iron Maiden because you all toured more recently with his group, British Lion. What, what, what was it like uh, dealing with uh, Steve and, and the Maiden guys? Well, the Maiden, you know, they, those two tours, Judas Priest was our first big tour across Canada and down through the States. And boy, did, were our eyes opened. That was a big education for us as to how the the big boys deliver it night after night after night consistently and with a sort of predictability to the show and and bringing it every night you know so we learned a lot from that and it toughened up our sound a little i think um and then the iron maiden but they were a little more standoffish they were probably about 10 years older than us jews priest the iron maiden guys were just about the same age as us maybe a year or two older and just friendlier blokier guys that you could have you could hang out at the pub with you you could imagine it and we did and they just were happy to see us every day and and they were just making that leap into being a stadium and arena act you know there were some sometimes on the tour where we'd play to 
1,500 people in Kalamazoo, Michigan, and, and the band's manager would give part of their feedback because he felt so bad for the promoter. And then a week later, you'd be filling the Philadelphia Spectrum where the, the Flyers used to play. So it was a real pivotal time for Iron Maiden at, at that period on the Peace of Mind tour. So we, we got along great with the Iron Maiden guys and kept a relationship with them, especially our, our bass player, Andy, who, uh, Andy Curran, he and Steve Harris became tennis buddies. And that uh, continued on where we, where we were invited out to Iron Maiden shows from time to time over the years when they were in the region. And solo band, British Lions, so he called, he called Andy Florida with British Lion. Will you guys please come out with us? So that, you know, it's a, it's a double bill. And wow, it'll be fun. And it sure was. Steve's a great guy. He's a holic. And, you know, he works so hard that when Iron Maiden has days off on their tours sometimes, he fills those in with British Lion shows. He gets his other band to come in. Okay, we're going to be in Czechoslovakia. August 13. So let's fill in August 14 and 15 on our day, Iron Maiden days off with a British Lion show. So that's, he's kind of a maniac that way, but great guy. Yeah. Well, you, you look at the guys these days, they're almost like athletes. You know, it's, there's, there's no time. You, you, like you say, you can have a couple pints at the pub, but you can't be sloppy drunk. You, you know, hard drugs. I mean, you got to wake up and, and bring it every day and, kind of like these athletes yeah. you know they they pack as much as they can into a day and when they're not on stage it's all about prepping or you know filling that with you know some of their other desires and you certainly see that with maiden staying so strong these days and being yes. one of the biggest touring acts in the world you know they fill fill those arena and stadiums all over the planet yes and that's a mark of intelligence to me a combination of intelligence and being committed to the the art, the music, the reason you began in the first place to make quality music and quality shows so that people want to come and see you. A lot of, like, too many times, you know, that some of our, our glory days of uh, bands, our favorites in the past, they'd get to that point of fame or popularity and then they would say, okay, I don't have to try anymore. I can just party it up now. And the whole thing would go to hell in no time. So, that's that's people taking a long range view as i always did you know when i was when i was a kid with coney hatch and everything i've done since i stayed i never touched drugs i never smoked a cigarette and i just drank once in a while for you know a bit of social drinking and i always stayed in shape and because i had that feeling i want to do this for a long time i want to be still capable of doing this when i'm 60 70 80 if anybody else still comes me, but I don't want my skills to deteriorate just because I didn't take care of myself. That's that's sin against what what you you started out with. I think. Well, that's it. You're you're cheating the audience, especially these days. They pay all that money. They come up. You got a hangover. You can barely yeah. hold your instrument. You know, it's a it's an affected performance. You know, it's it's sacrilege. I mean, they should get their money back. It's really you you got to deliver deliver the goods, like you say and certainly uh, Rob Halford and Steve Priest, or I'm sorry, Steve Harris and, and all the guys do. Now, the band, after all your great years through Coney Hatch and April Wine and Guess Who and all that, um, I know you've added Sean Kelly to the, to yeah. the team. What, what, what does Sean bring to add that extra spark to Coney Hatch's live show, which everybody's going to be checking out? Well, Sean, first of all, is a, is a marvelous, he's a rocker at heart. He uh, said, he was just telling me this story last night. We've known each other for about 10 years, but we're still learning new things about each other. His parents said they'd pay for a university degree for him. He wanted it to be in music. And so he learned to play the classical guitar in record time so that he could get admitted to the university music course. And then he went on classical albums, and at the mean, same time, he, was, he had his rock bands. He had a group called Crash Kelly that did, uh, I think, four or five different albums. They were on the L.A. scene for a little while with some of the – Gilby Clark, I remember, was somebody that got involved with them. And, and Sean is just a wonderful guitar player with his own sense of the rock spirit. But he was also a Coney Hatch fan when he was a kid. He's from up north as well, like me, up northern Ontario. And he uh, – he talks about when he was 15, he, he came to see us play at the arena there. So, uh, or maybe even younger. I think he might have even have been 12 
uh, he's, he's also a guy that has a respect for the music, but enough of his own identity that he, he wants to play it right, the way he remembers it exciting him, but he also wants to add his own elements to it where it's possible. And he's just all in for making the show as quality as he can. And we're, you know, it's, it's good for us to have a guy that's younger in there too. He'll go, he came after us, come on guys, let's do something in the studio. Let's do something new. So that's why we did, because <laughs> the young guy was after us. Yeah, I met him years back here in LA with the Crash Kelly project. And I could just tell, you know, you can, you have that radar a, a, after being in the business so long of like, who's real and who, who's yeah. kind of faking it, you know? And you could, you could just see that one way, yeah. one way or the other, th this guy was going to be one of those survivors who ended up somewhere doing something great. And obviously you guys are about to bring yeah. it. And the L Macombo, of course, a lot of us that grew up in the 70s remember when the Rolling Stones did those secret shows up there in 77 where April Wine opened. I think they, they, were, they were calling themselves the Cockroaches or something. That's right. Yeah, yeah, I, I have the, I, yeah, I have the mobile truck tape. Of, of those shows that a friend of mine from Toronto was one of the sound engineers on it so he shared them with me and it's it's pretty exciting stuff um the the rolling the Elma combo night with, with the rolling stones are probably the international claim to fame for the club and we played there in 83 when it was it was just starting to fade from its glory days at that time uh, i remember our road crew complaining that uh they didn't like the load in <laughs> So it was on the second floor and they had to carry all the, the heavy amps and, and cases up. And uh, it, it was just starting to get a little run down at that time, but it was still considered a prestige gig. And then as time went by, it, uh, it eventually closed after a succession of owners, but it's been reopened with a uh, huge investment and in just making the place so beautiful and high quality uh, to the point that it just reopened uh, this year for, for new shows with a fellow named Michael Weckerly. Well, that's amazing. I know October 3rd, the online show, uh, everybody's so amped up, you know, because we, we've been sitting at home, you know, we'd love to come out and, and, and rock, but until we can, it's the next yes. best thing, you know, and I know with Coney Hatch 4 in 2013, you guys added some new vigor, you know, some new songs and stuff to the set. So what can we expect on your live performance coming up? We will have, first of all, the, the TV broadcast will open with uh, an interview segment that uh, Andy Kerr and I did together. Tell some of the history stories and memories, and then we will have uh, songs from all four of those Coney Hatch albums represented in the set. And all, mo almost all the ones you'd expect. I know we have a, a European segment of our fan base that really loved our third album, Friction. Uh, most and that was our most popular album there so uh they always want come on can you play the, the friction album in, in its entirety <laughs> for a show for us and you know we're not really positioned to do that but we'll have we'll have some of that i, I know the europeans will say why didn't you do more but yes there's something from each of the four albums and we're in rehearsals and just having a good time with that we always enjoy seeing each other we've been you know andy and i and dave ketchum the drummers uh, began this band together in 81 and they're among my dearest friends on the planet after all these years so it's a real joy to get together make music with that those sounds that only we together can make well that's coming up on the 40th anniversary of the band you know that's like a fine wine yeah. you know it's aged it's aged well <laughs> you know and and people you know even the youngsters today they're going back to these bands from the 70s and 80s you know and listening to their parents' record collection or hearing about this classic rock. What, what do you think it was about, you know, those bands in the 70s and early 80s that, that really stood, you know, stands the test of time? I think there was a combination of, first of all, the, the affluence of the post-war boom made more things possible to more people. There was the the 1960s, call it an overthrow of previous restraints and, and restricted thoughts about how you present yourself. Wildness was allowed into the, the, uh, the music culture.
for the first time on a large scale and just overthrow of the previous generations were about. And more than ever, a combination of the blues influences and jazz influences of black music that melded with the rock bands that were coming up. As, as we all know, so many of the, the giants of British rock grew up wanting to playing the blues from Howlin' Wolf and Muddy Waters and, and all the, Elmore James, you know, all the, the blues artists from, from Amer records coming from America that, and Chuck Berry, that uh, people in America had forgotten. It's, it's like that music had to go across the ocean and then be pr presented fresh in a, in a more palatable version the math audience of America. So there, there was, and there was the excitement of hockey rink and the stadiums being used for concerts, massive scale for the first time. Rock radio spread the word all over the, the uh, communities and throughout the land. And marketing, I think, was, the, was a final element of it where all the, you know, a record company could let the whole music commercialized world know all at the same time about the new record from their favorite artist. And people thought music was important because it was attached to the culture at that time. So they paid more attention. They had more interest in reading about it and buying magazines devoted to music and listening to radio shows devoted to just talking about music. And those were the days when, you know, the, all the guys would have their jean jacket with their favorite band's names emblazoned across the back. There'd be the ACDC guys or the, uh, Black Sabbath guys, or the different guys that would show their loyalty to their favorite band with the things they wore. And that's a cultural thing that uh, was, was all just positive, I think. Because, and that's, that's the energy that everybody retained from it. That's why we all look back so fondly as those days where we were all united, even though we liked different kinds of music or different bands were our favorites. Everybody had that feeling of being swept along together on this wave of something beautiful. Well, yeah, it started our insatiable appetite to find new music to fall in love with. And I always say, you know, if you fall in love yeah. with a band like Zeppelin, the next best thing is to dig in their roots, you know, find out where that music came from, you know, or, you know, any of that, yes. the Rolling Stones or the Beatles, you know. And yes. like you say, it gave people here uh, an increased pride in this musical heritage that they thought oh that's 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 my grandfather father's music or something and then they found out that led, led zeppelin or the rolling stones or the beatles like bowed down to these guys yeah. these, these guys were gods to them yes yes and in the in addition to that it was now presented by young men from england then the the young men in in america could say, oh, I want to be like that guy. I want to, he looks like me. Well, perhaps, you know, the, the racial difference that made the, the black music not able to make the lead original form, it was made more palatable by good looking young white guys with long hair and tight jeans. <laughs> and the, the developed the next step they took it to with the electric guitars and the energy, as you say, Ze Zeppelin just crashing down the barriers in so many ways, along with the other bands that use that music as their roots. Well, our, our guest is Ben Carl Dixon. He is the lead singer and guitarist with Coney Hatch. You're going to see him on stage with the boys, including Sean Kelly, tearing it down October 3rd. Look below for the link. ConeyHatch.com will get you all the access you need to get in. Make sure you get your ticket. Get into this online extravaganza. Carl, thank you so much for all the years of rocking, all the great music that you've provided. And congratulations on your amazing comeback. I, I, I know you are a true survivor. It is absolutely inspiring to us all. No one has an excuse when they see someone like yourself come back from all odds and, and really bring it. And I know they're going to see a show uh, October 3rd and a course with new music coming up that Coney Hatch and Carl Dixon are going to rock forever. Thank you so much for joining us today. This has been a real pleasure, Jay. For, hey, everybody, for 10 bucks, you can see a band that we're really proud of to present to you. Thanks, Carl. Till our next time, please keep rocking. Thank you very much.